Welcome back guys. Now we start with the generalization bound, which is basically derived from the empirical risk minimization principle, which is formulated in here with this in this particular inequality. Just remember we have a probability that the greatest as possible divergence or uh, considering the whole set of admissible functions, aka algorithm bias. Okay? So getting every possible function from that particular bias, we measure the expected risk and the empirical risks, risk <clears throat> and compute the divergence for both. And the worst case scenario, assuming the worst case uh, uh, is greater than uh, a given epsilon, which is a divergence factor, a divergence factor is smaller than or equal to two times the Shetwin coefficient function, which is in here. Just to get back, this is the Shetwin coefficient, fu coefficient function for a two, uh, for considering two samples, both uh, each one with n n examples. Therefore, we have altogether two n instances or two n input examples, and <clears throat> and given the exponential of one, a minus n epsilon to the square here is epsilon. Okay, it's just a different epsilon, but it should be the same. Divided by four. So from this uh, empirical risk minimization principle, we get we just make this upper term equals to delta so that's going to be delta every everything over here on the right is going to be delta <clears throat> and then we solve this delta equals to the right to the right term uh, we solve for epsilon for this epsilon over here of course assuming delta is greater than zero it's just impossible to have a, a negative delta because this is an upper bound in terms of a probability, okay? Just to make sure we are at the same page. So making delta equals to this term, we solve for epsilon, and to solve for epsilon, we can divide delta for, by two times the Sheffield coefficient as shown here. <clears throat> then we can apply a log function on both sides and we will have log of this exponential function equals of log of delta minus log of this uh, denominator over here, over here. Okay, that's that's how you obtain it. Obtained it. Then we of course can cancel out the exponential function by applying the log. So we have minus n epsilon to the square divided by four, as shown here and log of delta minus log of two times the shattering coefficient. Then we divide, of course, we multiply, sorry, this right uh, hand term by uh, four divided by n, of course, in negative, in negative format. So minus four over n multiplied by the right side term and epsilon is going to be equal to this squared root we don't have like plus and minus over here because epsilon is always uh, is always positive because it is a divergence given an absolute value of the expected and the empirical risks. Okay. This is epsilon. So given this epsilon, what is interesting is basically that Vapnik just unplugged the probability over here and assessed this worst case scenario or the epsilon we found before. So this turned out to be uh, opened like this, analyzing just the worst case scenario for the worst case, uh, for the worst classifier we can obtain from this bias, from this algorithm uh, space of divisible functions. So given that we have this as epsilon as shown before, and then Given here, we are analyzing the cases that we surpass epsilon, the cases that our worst case classification 
uh, is greater than a given epsilon, and that's the same as the missing missing probability or the missing chance or the chance of making mistakes, so to speak, we can analyze the opposite. We can come up with a complement of this binary situation, the case in which we are smaller than or equal to this divergence term, which is represented by this scenario over here. So this is the most interesting to assess, and this is the one that helped to come up with the generalization bound. So, in uh, let's say, in good conditions, our worst case scenario is going to be smaller than or equal to this, to this epsilon. Of course, someone has to define delta, an acceptable delta, and we have to find the shattering coefficient, of course, in this scenario. But anyway, <clears throat> let's go ahead. So this is the modification we just decided here to, to make. That's the same as assessing the complement of delta. Instead of, of, one, of delta, one minus delta. The probability that we keep a good result given this epsilon. So from this, we, uh, Vapnik just wrote, rewrote this sup, sup over here, this supreme over here as the expected risk of f minus the empirical risk of f given given the empirical risk for a given classification uh, given classifier is always smaller than or equal to its expected risk why because we bias we select a classifier based on our data and when it's selected based on our data, the empirical risk, which is measured on our available data, is going to be, of course, smaller than, in absolute terms, to the expected risk. So this divergence is always going to be positive and there is no need of this absolute value. Consider here as the worst case classifier, just to make sure I wrote it here. We could use like some W over here, just to make sure it's a worst case scenario and not to somehow make sure with or confound with <clears throat> any function inside the space of divisible functions, but actually the worst case classifier. Okay, so from here, we've got this formulation. And by just using the empirical risk on the right side, we have the generalization bound shown over here. This generalization bound shows us that the expected risk for a given worst case scenario is going to be smaller than or equal to the empirical risk for the same classifier plus some variance over here. This variance term is directly Dep it depends directly on the Shetri coefficient and also on delta, which is uh, a confidence level to be selected, to be defined, as shown here, for our probability. We could define delta as 0 0.05, for example, so our probability <clears throat> would be insured for 95% of the scenarios. If delta is equal to 0 0.01, our probability would be um, assessed for 99% of the scenarios, okay? So, of course, I can select, I can define this uh, bound to make sure our convergence, our uniform convergence respects it. Of course, the tighter the bond is, I mean, the smaller delta is, the more difficult uh, it is to ensure the convergence and more examples we need, I mean, n has to be greater to ensure learning. Okay, so this is what we refer to generalization bound. Uh, at this point, I suggest you guys to assess multiple classif uh, classif uh, classification algorithms. Just, just for example, um, <clears throat> select, for instance, a given, classif uh, given classification algorithm that, for instance, provides an empirical risk, let's say the empirical risk of the first, I'm going to write like this, of f 
for our algorithm one is going to be equals to 0 0.01 and for algorithm two is going to be 0 0.05 so of course i know the risk is the error so the error is greater for the second algorithm so one, maybe you think okay the, the second algorithm uh, makes more mistakes yes that's true but is it is it better or worse to be selected in my scenario well that depends on other on some other factors for instance let's define our shuttle coefficient function for the first algorithm to be equals to n to the fifth and let's define the Schaffin coefficient function for our second algorithm being equal to n to the fourth so it's got like less complexity the, the second algorithm and let's evaluate for our sample size from 1 to 10,000 for example and then let's suppose delta to be equal to 0 0.05 so I wish to ensure for 95% of the scenarios so in this case I recommend you guys to plot the empirical risk plus the square root of 4 over n multiplied by log of 2 times our shattering coefficient for the first algorithm, okay, minus log of delta, and plot this to compare the first and the second algorithms. So we are going to find something like this, a curve like this, and for the second algorithm, let's plot in red, of course, using algorithm 2 instead of 1 and considering the same delta of course and the same sample size we are going to find a red curve like it is shown, shown here but actually I suggest you guys to plot using lines for both and not just plot using lines but also limit our y axis from 0 to 1 just because it's a probability so what matters is from 0 to 1 it doesn't matter if the value is greater and here we have our curves as you might notice the red curve comes like somehow lower than black one over here up to a given limit a given number of observations and up after that limit it changes and it comes it, it becomes the opposite okay the black one is lower and the red one is higher that means basically in this scenario it means that the lower we have like the the the, the great the greatest is the convergence of course so in this scenario if i have like 10,000 observations i should select algorithm one okay in this scenario because it converges uh it has a tighter convergence uh in comparison to algorithm two that basically means from this that my expected risk is going to be smaller than or equal to this sum so it's going to be smaller than or equal to this black curve in case of my algorithm one and smaller than or equal to this red curve in case of my algorithm two if i had like less than let's say around like 1000 or 800 examples it would be the opposite my algorithm two would be better than algorithm one. what i'm going to do now is just <clears throat> bring some different perspectives so i'm going to change the shattering coefficients i'm going to increase this shattering coefficient for algorithm one even more and to tenth like this and then plot for you so plotting for algorithm one we have this and plotting for algorithm two 
we will have this behavior over here. Now you guys can see, can notice that the smaller expected risk is going to be provided for the second algorithm, which is defined by the red curve. Why the first algorithm is just worse. But it is worse than this red one, the algorithm two, for a limit up to uh, equals to 10,000 observations. What happens if I change my number of observations and probably I have like 20,000 for training? If I have a sample size equals to 20,000 for training, my result is going to be quite different. Let's plot the first algorithm one and now algorithm two. Take a look. Algorithm two is still better, but they are somehow getting closer. Let's increase our sample size. Let's say now we have like 40,000 training instances or examples for training. Plotting the first and plotting the second algorithm in red. Now, the red and the black, they cross each other at this point. As you guys may, may notice over here, let me increase this. I suppose you guys will, yeah, maybe I can just increase my sample size to 50,000. And I suppose you guys will notice the difference like this. So first and second algorithm in red. Yeah, better. So around like 37, 36 or 35,000 observations, my black or algorithm one turns out to uh, outperform the algorithm two, which is in red. That basically means that it, actually I should select either algorithm one or algorithm two based on the sample size I have. If I have less than 35,000 training instances, I should go for algorithm two, which is in red. If I have more, I should go for algorithm uh, one, which is in black, especially because I have a tighter convergence for algorithm two when I have less than 35, approximately, of course, roughly 35,000 instances. If I have more, I should undoubtedly choose algorithm one, which is in black, because it provides a tighter bound for our expected risk. I can also see the values. If I don't want to plot like this, I can just come here, for example, instead, instead of plotting for algorithm one, I could just save this, like, Let's say this is going to be the bound for the expected risk of f for algorithm 1. And this is going to be the bound for algorithm 2. And the, the, my point over here is this. Let's suppose I do have, for example, a sample size equals to 10,000. If it's 10,000 for algorithm 1 and algorithm 2, I should select 2 because it provides a tighter bound for my expected risk. However, if I have like 35,000 algorithm 1 and 35,000 for 2, I should select 1 because it provides a tighter bound. Of course, for 50, it's going to be algorithm 1 again okay so i can use this as a way of selecting the best algorithm besides that in addition to that i can also uh i can also compare um i can also come up with a different strategy for example i can if i don't have access to this shattering coefficient let's suppose i don't have access to it and uh, let's say I'm not interested in selecting a given delta, but I know I have this term over here. I just know it. Okay? This term happens here. What I can do, I can just compare, uh, instead of using the expected risk here and the empirical risk here, you guys know that 
this ex empirical this expected risk and empirical risk turn turn out to be very close when the uh, when the uh, sorry this uh, expected risk and empirical risk could be um, could be rewritten in terms of two expect two empirical risks. So I could have one empirical risk in a sample and a second in another sample. Of course, this is the case when my n is large enough. So if you guys, for example, have, let's say, like, would be like 50,000 examples, you could just divide this, for example, in two samples with 25,000 each. You could train your your classifier on this on this sample over here and measure the empirical risk, and you have this. You could again measure on this sample, and you have a an, an approximation for this expected risk. You could compute the divergence in between both. So, for example, let's suppose. We have something like 0 0.01 as empirical risk computed on the first training sample. The same sample I've trained on. And let's say we have something like 0 0.1 when I compute my empirical risk on the, on the second sample. This divergence, okay, in absolute value is going to be an estimation for this epsilon value that means and probably you guys remember something here that when you guys study the k-fold cross validation and let's suppose we are assuming k to be a tenfold cross validation what you're doing is basically computing you can compute your empirical risk on a given sample and compute your risk in a different sample, that's why I'm using an, an apostrophe over here. And you guys can just, let's say at first you are going to have your empirical risk on your first sample, then you have on uh, your first holdout fold, then on a second holdout fold, and then you have that up to your tenth holdout fold. You can come up with a data distribution on top of this. You can come up with an approximation of a data distribution. For instance, let's suppose our, um, our uh, risks have like an average equals to 0 0.05 having uh, this standard deviation, like 0 0.01, and we measure like 10 numbers, okay? I'm just going to say this in empirical all folds over here, okay? Like this. What I can do is basically analyze this, uh, all those values over here to understand how they deviate from one another. So that's a way of understanding this epsilon over here. It's quite interesting, isn't it? So I can come up with the greatest as possible divergence given all those guys. So I could compute what is the minimal value and what's the maximum value over here. And this would be a nice approximation to say that our over here would have, okay, our uh, square root over here is greater than of course, it's the same as bringing this empirical risk to this side and having something like this minus my empirical risk of f to be smaller than or equal to epsilon, which is the square root. But instead of having the expected risk here, because I cannot compute it, I'm having two empirical risks. One that's greater and one that's smaller, or basically computing the absolute value over here for the worst case scenario. From this, and as we increase our sample size, 
I could have like a bunch of numbers over here. Let's say um, I have this number for a sample size equals to, I don't know, could be like uh, every fold over here was tested on 10,000 examples. So this considered 10,000 examples and this also 10,000 examples. This, of, of course, would have absolute for a 10,000 scenario. So we have something like the square root of 4 over 10,000, okay, times log of 2 times the shattering coefficient function, like this, for 20,000, for twice the number, sorry, twice the number of observations, and of course, oh, sorry, because here we have another parenthesis, over here, minus log of some delta that we can just define. We can come up and define it like this. Let's say it's going to be 0 0.05. So, uh, besides I, I don't have access to the shattering coefficient, now I can estimate it. I can understand how my shattering coefficient function behaves. Because I have my risk on a sample, my risk in another sample, both with, with the same sizes because they, because they were computed on, on folds with the same size, okay? And of course, we know the size, so we can divide and we know how this, at least we know how this function is going to be applied. I mean, it's going to be applied on twice the number of observations we have, and here we have some delta we must or we wish to ensure. Okay? Of course, we can simplify this, we can power this to 2, okay, and remove the square root over here and simplify in attempt to perform some regression and understand how is like the Shelton coefficient. By knowing how it's like the shattering coefficient, we can <clears throat> come back and compare two different classification algorithms. That's a task I wish you guys to perform for to any two classification algorithms you guys know could be like the perceptron against the multi-layer perceptron, or it could be uh, a distance-weighted nearest neighbors against uh, I don't know, the support vector machine could be any kind, any pair, or maybe more than two classification algorithms. Of course, now at this point, you see that our course on the statistical learning theory assumes you guys know at least the basics of machine learning. If you don't, I suggest you guys to study a lot of machine learning and then you come back to study the statistical learning theory, okay? Just to carry on, there is a very nice result found after visualization bound. If you guys notice, uh, when uh, at the limit, when the, my sample size tends to infinity, if this log this log over here divided by this n converges to zero in the limit, I mean, when my n tends to infinity, that means basically that this term, this variance, this divergence epsilon is going to approach zero. If it approaches zero, eventually what's going to happen is that my empirical risk is going to be a very good estimator for my expected risk, right? That's the same as this. If I consider, for example, that my shattering coefficient function, let's use here for a, two, a sample size equals to 2n, let's say it is equals to n to 100. Oh, that's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot, but let's consider my n now goes from 1 to a very large number like this, okay? What's like my, the log of two times my shattering coefficient divided by n? It's going to somehow, oops, sorry. Let's do it again. This 
should converge to um, to zero somehow. Is that is that the case? Of course, R cannot solve it. We have to solve this in the limit, in the limit for n approaching infinity. What I'm going to do now for you guys is I'm going to open over here a browser like this. I'm going to open Alpha Wolfram, Wolfram which I, I think and I suggest you guys to, to use when you don't have like any sort of standalone application to compute limits or derivatives. And here, over here, I'm going to write, okay, I want to assess the limit, okay, of log of two times something, that yeah, could be like two times n, to 100, oops, not 1000, 100 over n when my n tends to infinity. Let's see how it works over here. Hmm. Let's see if I wrote it correctly. Take a look over here, guys. The log of two times my shattering coefficient, which, which is, of course, very, very high. Uh, okay, very large, divided by n turns out to approach zero at the limit. It's even easier if I consider something like this, right? Log of two n to any power p divided by n. Of course, this is the same using log properties. This is the same as p multiplied by log of n. Okay? E multiplied by log of n divided by n. If p is a constant, if p is a constant, of course, my log is going to reduce much faster than my linear function in terms of n. So my log divided by n is going to approach zero, of course. So this is the same as rewriting this like this times some p and p could be anything could be any constant of course if p is infinite we cannot compute it but if p is a constant yeah there's a solution as you guys can see here but if instead of that let's suppose my shattering coefficient is 2 power to n in that scenario my log is going to be log of 2 power to n divided by n, and I wish this to be equal to 0. But what's going to happen? Here my p is not a constant anymore, it's n by itself. So in this case, I have a limit like this, a limit of n, 2 power to n divided by n, given n goes to infinity. And here we have log of 2. And of course, given it does not converge to 0, I have no learning guarantee. Why I don't have no learning guarantee according to the generalization bound and consequently according to the empirical risk minimization principle? Just because this term over here which measures the divergence in between the empirical and the expected risk has no bound. This guy over here is going to grow to infinity. So how can I have a bound to say that the empirical risk is going to be as close as possible to the expected risk if this guy goes to infinity? Just impossible. That's why if this is the case, if I have a given classification algorithm whose uh, shattering coefficient approaches uh, goes to infinity or it, it is represented by an exponential function such as 2 power to n besides having a space of dimensible functions that can represent every possibility for my classification problem the problem is besides representing every possibility I cannot guarantee learning just because inside that space I will have, most probably have, the memory-based classifier. You guys remember?
previous classes, the memory base, base classifier. From this, okay, we have this as a very important con conclusion for now. Uh, and what is interesting now, and I suggest you guys, just to, just to remember, we can plot the approximation error versus the estimation error. When I have a space of admissible functions over here, which is my, my set F, uppercase F, when my space is quite restrictive, it contains less functions, my estimation error is going to be quite small as shown in here. What means that the cost or the effort I have to, uh, to move from a first classifier to the best as possible classifier inside the same space of functions is small. But if I leave that space, that set, and I go for the best as possible F base, which is the best classifier ever in my universe of functions F all, I will have a very large approximation error. If, on the contrary, my space of admissible functions is very complex, of course, my estimation error or the cost I have to converge from a given initial classifier or classification function to the best as possible classification function is going to be amazingly huge. But the cost to go to the best as possible classifier in the universe, which is known as F base, is going to be quite small. We discussed that before. This balance provides us the risk. I'm going to discuss on this, giving like some, some very nice examples. I also suggest you guys to go back to the paper by von Luxburg and Schokopf which is entitled uh, the Statistical Learning, what's the name? It's like this, Statistical Learning Theory, Models, Concepts, and Results, which is in here. Statistical Learning Theory, Models, Concepts, and Results. I suggest you guys to read it, like not just once, but like five times to get the big picture and understand what's happening behind, okay? See you guys in the next video.